Welcome back, troglodytes, to the Trogly's Guitar Show. Today we have a 1981 Gibson Les Paul Custom that has quite a few different stories behind it. Now this guitar is a studio warrior. It sat in some studio for apparently 20 some years and whatnot, and it was just played on by a lot of different people. And that is very apparent by its condition. It's got lots of wear and tear just about everywhere on this guitar, as well as tons of replaced parts. However, this guitar is the first guitar I've had in a little while that raises the question, are there bugs in our guitars? Now this is not the first really old Les Paul that I've opened up in the back to find bugs that have just been there for years. Now you can see the photos of the bug that I found in the control cavity, and that thing had definitely been in there a long time, because you can see it's just this crystallized color now. So it raises the question, does Gibson ship guitars out that might have bugs in the control cavity? They definitely have a lot of lumber coming in and out. I mean, I'm sure they have some sort of pest infestation control, but who's to say there isn't a few that get caught in there for years? And I usually find those bugs in guitars that haven't been opened up before. I think my original 2550, when I opened that one up, it had like three or four of the same kinds of bugs. So I don't think these are boring bugs. Wood boring anyways. It's just kind of interesting to find an insect from the 70s in your guitar. Now besides being a studio warrior, this guitar consumed another guitar. And what I mean by that is this guitar took on a whole different identity. The seller I purchased this guitar from, I had purchased from him before. I believe that was a 90s Les Paul Custom. And he was advertising this guitar as a Les Paul Custom KM. And if you don't know what the KM model is, that one was produced pretty much only in 1979. And it was a Les Paul standard that was kind of the first 59 styled reissue. Obviously, everything was just about wrong. The only thing they had going for it is basically the two-piece top. But it was a start in the right direction for Gibson. But this guitar had all the parts of a Les Paul KM. It had the Les Paul KM truss rod cover. It had the Les Paul KM pickups in it. The seller even said the pots were from 1979. And he also said the guitar was all original. So I was really scratching my head on this one. Was there a Les Paul KM Custom that I've just never heard of? After looking at the seller's photos and seeing that the last three digits were over $4.99, that told me this was not even made in Kalamazoo. So those parts couldn't be original. So I purchased this guitar knowing that this was not what the seller thought it was. I think he gets a lot of his information just from who sells the guitar to him. He's a great guy, no fault, no harm. I knew what I was buying anyways, and I told him that once I got it, and he's like, wow, I'm glad you know more about the guitar than I did. Now those Les Paul KM parts, they have no business being on this guitar, so I took them off and I kind of just put some other parts in. Now the reason why I do that is because that's kind of the tough side of business. I mean, I like it because it kind of has a history for this guitar, but at the same time, nobody is going to pay what those parts are worth for a beat up Les Paul Custom. You can see right here the Les Paul KM truss rod cover. Somebody probably needs one of these out there, so these parts will be for sale separately. And then there's these puppies. These are double cream T-tops. They were only in the Les Paul KM. These are the pickups that kind of started the kerfuffle with the Marzio and their whole double cream patent. Now there are a few other models that Gibson made that did get the double creams, but this is the only one that is a T-top. Most double creams you find out there are usually dirty fingers, or some other variety of pickup. If you see a double cream T-top, it has most likely been taken from a Les Paul KM. These are very rare and expensive pickups to find for sale separately. This guitar also originally had the flip out winding tuners. Unfortunately, again, it's just business guys. I hate taking original parts off of guitars, but I did put a regular styled Gibson branded Schaller on it and these will be for sale separately as well. So to replace those parts, I put a vintage The Paul truss rod cover on here simply because I didn't have a Les Paul custom one. 
Uh, the Paul, if you're not familiar with that model, is basically kind of the early studio before they were actually called studios. They are phenomenal guitars and they're all made of walnut and they have ebony fretboards. I would definitely suggest checking one out. If you're interested in this guitar and you'd rather have a brand new Les Paul Custom Truss Rod cover, I'll take this one off and just order you a brand new one. It should probably arrive the same time the guitar does. I put the regular Gibson branded Schallers on here, but they fit in the exact same footprint. And if I didn't tell you, you wouldn't have known anyways. And I believe the pickups I put in are the 490R and 498T Gibsons. That's what they use in modern day customs. And despite the seller thinking these were 79 pots, they're actually 1980s on the tones and 1981 on the volume. That's pretty common to see mix match dates on the tone and volume pots. I know on most of my Spotlight Special collection, the volumes were actually from 80 and then the tones were from 83 and the guitar was from 83. So I believe the pots are still original to this guitar. Now, I don't know if this was a factory chrome model or not. I mean, these are era correct, but they could have been replaced. So I'll take that as it is. The switch tip itself appears to have been filed down a little bit. You can see it looks a little short, but it does appear era correct. Uh, pick guard looks good to me and you have Schaller buttons. So I've made this guitar kind of a player's grade custom. That way I can offer a slightly cheaper one for somebody who really doesn't care about originality. So an early 80s custom, what are your specs? You still have your maple top, you've got a mahogany back, and the maple neck is still on, as is the volute. Now this volute starts to disappear in late 81 and 82. And then somewhere around the same time as that, they start transitioning back into the mahogany necks. So this mid 81 Les Paul Custom is kind of one of the last maple necks you'll see. And it is a three piece maple neck. A lot of people say the maple neck is stronger than a mahogany neck. And they say it gives you more bite in your tone. But I'll let you guys do your own judging on that. I mean, personally, I think there is a lot more difference in your amp that you're using than anything your guitar could ever be made of. Honestly, if you're buying a gigging setup, I would suggest buying a high-end amp and a low-end guitar. However, most people go the other way around. They buy the high-end guitar, like this, and then they really don't care about what amp they get. They just buy a bunch of pedals and think it'll sound better. I'm guilty of that myself. I still like to have a fancier guitar. I think it inspires me to play more than a fancy amp. However, as far as tone goes, you're way better off with the fancy amp. This one weighs 10 pounds, 6.7 ounces, and has a 60 slim neck profile. 
If you notice anything different, I fixed my camera setting. Apparently I had it on a really weird white balance for like the past year, which made all my videos appear slightly more blue. So this should be a more accurate color representation. I've also been experimenting with some different mics. I was just using the Rode VideoMic Go and I was happy with it, but it kept picking up the clicking sound my camera makes for the autofocus. And on a few videos, I was testing out a lapel mic. I really didn't like the sound of that one. It was a little bit too quiet. And unless you were listening on like your phone or with headphones, you really couldn't hear me despite even cranking up the volume. So now I'm testing out this NTG2 mic. So let me know how you feel about that one. I got this one at Sweetwater the day I saw Joe Walsh's last Paul. All right, so let's go over the condition of this guitar. The face of the headstock is actually in pretty good shape for being a studio warrior. Now, when we get it in the light just right, you can see there is some scratches and smudges and a little bit of finish checking in this area. But I would say the headstock is fairly clean. This guitar was absolutely filthy when I got it, so I polished it up with some Virtuoso polish. And I think I did a pretty okay job on this guitar. I like that this one has a nice, even light yellow glow. It's not too over the top. It's just that beautiful vintage vibe. Again, the truss rod cover has been replaced and the tuners are original styled, but not the original ones. The frets are in good shape. I would say that they're your typical low and wide frets of the era. I would say they probably have one level recrown job left in them. I could be wrong about that. But as of right now, they just have some minor flattening spots. Now, if you're used to a modern fret style, you're not gonna like this guitar because these are very low frets. So bending is gonna take a little bit more effort. However, once you're used to these Norland era Les Paul customs, they're usually pretty comfortable to play. Now this guitar has a really great color. It kind of appears dark and then once you get it in the light, it appears more red. It is a beautiful wine red finish. But get it here in the light and you can see all of that nastiness right there. That's just from people's picks and bracelets. It's just really dinging up the finish. But you can really only see it when you get it in the light just right. It kind of gives this guitar character. Now, if this was the only area that was in, I would say that is a blemish and kind of an eyesore. But since this whole front is pretty well chewed up, I think that's what makes it classified as character at this point. Here again, you can see the beautiful three piece maple top. Again, you have quite a few finish breaking dings as well. I would say this is definitely the worst one right there. But this guitar just has a certain vibe to it. I really like this one. I know Tommy, the guy who does some of my demos now, he really liked this guitar. So condition wise on the front, it's a little bit chewed up, but it's not so much of an eyesore except for maybe this little spot and this one. Back of the headstock, our serial number is 8181 1509. Made in USA, Nashville plant. Again, you have original styled Gibson tuners on here, era correct, but not the original to this guitar. You still have your volute and there is a small little ding right there. And in the right lighting, you can see some light checking, but it's just the natural kind of checking, not because of trauma necessarily. Something I forgot to point out while I was recording this video is there is a very small line right along the wing of the headstock on the treble side. Now, when you feel this area with your fingernail, it almost feels like it's a bump, not necessarily like a separation. What I think this might be, and I just realized this from looking at this exact photo, is maybe that some of the glue that Gibson used to put the wings on the headstock that seeped out just a hair, and that's why you can feel it raised up in that area. Now, the neck is in good shape. You've got some light wear to it. And on the treble side of the neck, you can see there is a little bit of finish wear here. It's just worn off in just a few areas. And while you're playing it, you don't see that area. So I'm not as turned off by that as I am when I can see it when I'm playing the guitar. So if you can live with a few light nicks and dings, you're in pretty good shape on this one. Now the back of this guitar at this angle looks great. Get it in the light, holy cow. 
<laughs> this thing was definitely played by people that wore belt buckles. Now luckily, very little of this buckle worming actually breaks the finish to become buckle rash, but it is definitely still a well-played guitar. Again, the pots in here, I believe, are the original ones, but obviously you've had some touch-ups to the solder joints on the pickups. The sides of the guitar are also kind of chewed up here, as you can see when we get it in the light. Got quite a few scratches and dulling to the finishes. And this chrome jack plate does look original to me, so I guess it is very possible this was a factory chrome model. You can see there's a lot of scratching by this bottom end pin. I almost thought that was from like a Bigsby or something, but what that really is is probably your strap scratching that up, like it has a little metal bit at the end. And you can see you've got lots of stand rash on this thing. But I definitely want to make sure to point this out, that the binding is actually red at the bottom of this guitar. Now, I don't believe that's actually finish bleed. That's actually probably caused from a guitar stand that this thing was sitting on for 20 years. Usually you'll see them turn like an amber color, but I've also seen this red color. But I'm guessing that's what this whole thing was. It was in contact with some sort of rubber that was not nitro safe. So overall, this is just the perfect player's grade custom. Hopefully you guys understand why I took the KM parts off of this thing, because who really wants to buy this guitar for, you know, $3,200 with those parts on it, versus you can get this one in the low twos now with other parts. Now we'll move on to the blacklight demo of this guitar. You can see the face of the headstock is glowing that perfect green hue, which we want to see. I don't see anything really of interest to point out on the face of the headstock. The body and knobs are also glowing the exact way they should. Here you can see those small little dings in the finish a little more clearly, as well as a scratch right there. You can also see here where some of the clear coat has been slightly worn away. That's why that glows a little bit of a darker color, because of somebody's sweaty hands. The back of the neck is also in good shape. You can see there's no breaks, cracks, or repairs, but you do have some stand rash on both sides of the neck. And the neck here, this shows you that the clear coat has been kind of worn away. Now the feel is just slightly different once you know that there's a difference, but if you don't see it under blacklight, you really don't feel any difference. But you can see this area of finish wear along the neck. Overall, definitely in good shape. Now the back, once again, this shows where that stand was. I guess it's possible somebody might have sprayed this with a red lacquer because it was chipping or something. However, usually it won't glow at all, so I don't believe that's what happened. I'm still gonna stick with my whole stand rash story, but for full disclosure, that is a possibility. The sides of the guitar are in the glowing state that I would think they would be with some clear coat worn off. But for the most part, we're in good shape here. Here you can see those stand rash marks even more. So overall, this one definitely passes the black light test and helps to illustrate some of the wear and tear this guitar has. This guitar comes in a non-original hard shell case. I would say this case is almost better than a Gen 2 chainsaw case. Those ones are just a little bit bulky if you have a large collection. But this is kind of like a late 90s, early 2000s case. It's a custom art historic case. It's pretty much the exact same thing as your Gibson custom shop cases of today. They have four latches on the front and a back latch. So five in total with a very nice slightly padded handle with a beautiful burgundy interior. Now these things are really heavily padded. They've got good heel support, a double neck rest, and a compartment lid. So overall, I would say this is a very good case on its own merits. I think these usually sell anywhere between like 180 to 250 bucks used. I'm sure somebody would trade you an original style case for this guitar in exchange for this one. But I would suggest keeping this case, honestly. If you think you might be interested in being the next owner of this 1981 Gibson Les Paul Custom, feel free to contact me on my Facebook page, facebook.com slash troglys, T-R-O-G-L-Y-S. Thank you, Troglodytes, for tuning in today. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.